Well, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? This is Jeremiah, and we're having another webinar here. All of us from our lockdown positions in our home offices, and as I'm sure many of you are, um, but we are still doing our webinars, um, and we got a nice one here. Um, it really got me thinking. Um, you know, I remember going to Chichen Itza in uh, in the Yucatan. And you know the, oh, they'll just show you how you can clap your hands and, and it echoes. And you know, I've also heard similar stories from like visiting the Roman Colosseum, uh, and how it really seems it's kind of this lost art of um, you know, of course, from back then, you know, they had to be able to hear a, a voice uh, in a plaza, and you know, so they really need to know how sounds echoed, and it really is something that was very common in, in more ancient architecture. Um, and I don't know if that's exactly what Alex is going to be showing, <laughs> but I know some aspect of it. I um, actually haven't gone through the whole presentation with him, but I know there's just some aspects of that. And so it's very exciting to me, and I hope it's exciting to you. Um, before we get going, I have a couple super quick housekeeping items. Um, I just want to let you know there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and I'd actually recommend clicking it right now and just kind of get that little question and answer box up. Um, so it's a little easier for you to type in a question if you have it, but note you'll be able to see any answers that we type to other questions. So it makes a fun little companion. Uh, for our and though, so you'll be watch um, many times you later, but. Get if you could. Um, but that is all my little uh, beginning. So I will get this handed over to Al. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Jer. Um, I think you touched on it a little bit when you mentioned how, you know, Chichen Itza, some of those ancient cultures, sound was uh, paid more attention. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about that, how, you know, in the last hundred years or so, sound has not gotten the appreciation it's gotten in the past. Um, you know, this is a, a topic that's really near to my heart. So hopefully you learned something today. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. All right, this is me. Uh, my background is in electrical and audio engineering. Um, for several years, I've done a lot of work with music and sound design and acoustics. Um, sound is a, a big passion of mine, so hopefully I can spread some of that excitement to you guys today. Uh, here at Land Effects, I do content creation and manufacturer relations. So a lot of the new CAD blocks or details you may be using in your projects I've created. Um, I'm also heavily involved in the development of our new lighting tools. And if you send in a support ticket, I may be the one helping you. All right, so here's what we're going to be talking about today. First, we'll go over a little groundwork, kind of lay the foundation of how sound works in space, how acoustics work. Then we'll define what we mean by soundscape talk about how we categorize sounds. We'll go over how to establish design objectives as far as sounds concerned. And then we'll talk about some techniques you can apply to your designs to reach those goals. Okay, before we get into it, why do we care about sound? This is a design and development philosophy called the triple bottom line. The idea is that at the intersection of creating economic value, societal value, and environmental value, that's where we get sustainable development, which is what we're all after. So as far as sound is concerned, um, sound is important for societal value. There's um, been plenty of studies by the World Health Organization and others that show not only do noise and negative sounds have a detrimental effect on our well-being, but positive sounds like music and sounds of nature are really good for our psyche. As far as environmental value, you know, we want to limit noise pollution. 
There's lots of wildlife who obviously use sound to communicate and we don't want to interfere with that. And for economic value, uh, I'll talk a little later in the presentation about how soundscape design can be incorporated into your current design principles without breaking the bank. Okay, so to kind of illustrate the effect that sound can have on the way you perceive a space, let's listen to two examples here. Let's say our goal is a tranquil, calming courtyard. I'm going to play the first one, listen to it, think about how the space sounds to you, what it makes you feel like if it feels tranquil and calming, and then we'll listen to the other and compare. Okay, now let's listen to this one. So I really like these examples because they really illustrate um, the difference between what soundscape design can do compared to the traditional approach, which is just eliminate all noise, all sound, make it as quiet as possible. Um, so kind of think about what each of these might look like, um, what sounds you're hearing and what you might see to accompany those. Here's what they actually look like. So obviously this one on the right is a little more visually appealing but I want you to note how this one on the left, even though there's no sounds other than just the footsteps or the clapping of the listener, this one you've got, you know, the sound of the fountain, you can hear birds, the leaves rustling. Even though this has more sound, it feels more tranquil and more calming. You can really hear the, the echo of the space in this one and it's almost unnerving. Okay, so let's talk about what's actually happening here, what sound is doing in these spaces physically. Um, it's, it's a little harder to understand intuitively what sound is doing in space compared to you know, vision. We don't have ear lids that we can close when we don't wanna listen. We can't uh, focus on something with our ears in the same way that we can focus our eyes. Um, so I'll kind of draw some comparisons to the way light works to help us gain a little intuition. So like light, sound waves radiate out in three dimensions from the source. Think about a candle in a dark room. Um, the candle flame is going to radiate light out in three directions. And the light that's going from the candle flame directly to our eye is what we're going to see. It's gonna look something like this. But we don't live in outer space. We have surroundings and the light that's reflecting out in other directions is going to reflect off of those surroundings and come to our eye. So you can see in this image on the right now, this is probably what you actually see with the candle in a dark room. Not only are you seeing the light that's coming from the candle flame directly to you, but the light that's going back bouncing off of the wall, bouncing off of this table that it's on, and that light's coming to your eye and giving you a sense of the space that you're actually in. And sound is gonna do the same thing. So let's listen to what that might sound like. First, we're gonna to listen to a light applause, just the direct sound, no reflections. Okay, and now let's listen to the kind of effect that surroundings can have on what you're hearing, uh, even when the source sound is the same.
So two extremes of the spectrum here, um, but it really helps show, you know, that the surroundings can have a really, really, really big effect even when the source is the same. So what are we looking at? What's happening here? When we have concave surfaces, like that second video clip we just watched, those are going to reflect the sound back to one area. You're really gonna get, uh, your ear is gonna hear the time difference between the source and the delay. And that's really going to enhance the sense of the space you're in. Conversely, convex surfaces like this are going to disperse the sound. So they're gonna bounce the sound off at greater angles. You're not gonna hear as much of those reflections. You're just gonna hear mostly the source and it's gonna feel more personal. Similarly, smooth, flat, hard surfaces are going to reflect sound. They're gonna reflect it at the angle it comes in at. And just like the concave surfaces, this is going to enhance the sense of space by letting your ear hear the difference between uh, you know, the time delay of the reflections compared to the source. Rough surfaces, however, textured surfaces, they're going to disperse the sound at various angles. This is going to uh, kind of increase the spread of the time delay with the reflections. Um, you're also gonna get more bounces off of the surface here before the sound really comes back. And each time it bounces, it's gonna be absorbed more by this material. So these rough surfaces are really going to not enhance the sense of space, but take it away, emphasize the source and make it feel more personal. So let's listen to another example here. This is a Cajon drummer named Ross McCallum. First, he's gonna play Cajon in an area with smooth, flat, hard surroundings. And listen to this one, think about how you can hear the echo, the sense of space and how it feels. So surrounded on four sides here by these flat, hard surfaces, you can really hear the echoes. You hear the space just as much as you hear the drum. Now let's listen to him playing Cajon in an area with rough textured surroundings. So you can really hear in this one, we've got a, uh, you know, all this, this soft dirt compared to the concrete. We've got uh, leaves on the ground making textures. We've got no flat walls here reflecting sound, but we got tree trunks, uh, all this foliage and, you know, different distances, different shapes. That's going to disperse and absorb the sound. So really in this one, you're hearing just the source and it feels more personal. This is why, uh, you know, places like uh, cathedrals or a concert hall like to use these big flat surfaces. They're trying to emphasize the sense of space and make you feel like you're in this large, awe-inspiring space um, compared to something like a public park where you just wanna, you know, feel personal and feel calm and, and safe here. Okay, so drawing further comparisons to light, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the visible light spectrum. Um, you know, this is all the colors of the rainbow, but there's also light below and above the range that we can see. So this is things like your TV remote uses infrared light. We can't see it, but you know, it communicates with the TV that way. Um, the sun emits UV light. We can't see that, but it burns us. It's the same thing with sound. There's a range of sound frequencies or pitches that we can hear down from you know, low, low pitches, almost rumbles up to high pitches like that mosquito tone. Um, and just like light, there are sounds below and above the range that we can hear. And it's important to pay attention to this because um, there are lots of animals, large animals like elephants and whales and animals like bats and dogs that 
do hear up in this range and down in this range. So even if we can't hear some of these sounds, it's important to pay attention to the sounds we're creating and whether they're kind of muddying up this area and interfering with communication. And so I mentioned earlier how light and sound are both waves. Um, this is true and they, they work in pretty similar ways, but here is a big difference between them. Uh, light wavelengths are tiny, tiny microscopic. Sound wavelengths, on the other hand, are a little bigger, and the frequency or pitch is going to have an effect on that. So the highest pitch we can hear, 17 millimeter wavelengths. The lowest pitch we can hear, 17 meter wavelengths. That's huge, big, big difference. Um, but what effect does that actually have? Why does that matter? Well, the idea is the longer the wavelength, the farther the sound will penetrate, meaning low frequency or low pitch sounds are going to travel farther and they're going to pass through materials more easily. This is why when this neighbor of yours drives down the street, you can hear his bass from inside your house because those low frequencies are really easily passing through your walls, but you don't hear the drums, the guitar, the singing. Those are higher frequencies that get blocked. So keep this in mind when we're talking later about, um, you know, the, the frequency and color of these sounds that we're trying to prevent from reaching an area where we don't want them. Okay, quick review before we move forward. Concave surfaces are going to focus those reflections and enhance the sense of space. Convex surfaces will disperse and absorb them. It's gonna feel more personal. Smooth surfaces allow those direct reflections and enhance the sense of space. Rough textured surfaces are going to disperse and absorb the sound. Just like colors of light, there's a wide range of sound frequencies and those low frequency sounds, the low pitch sounds, in order to block those, they're gonna require dense, thicker materials. Okay, one last thing here. How about measurement? How do we measure uh, the loudness of sounds? Well, it's a little counterintuitive, but our ears perceive loudness logarithmically, not linearly. So I'm assuming you're familiar with exponentials. It's basically the same thing here. And you don't need to understand too much of the math or how this scale works. Just know that we measure loudness in decibels. You'll see dB or dBA. And the rule of thumb to remember is just for every 10 decibels of reduction in the loudness of a sound, it's going to sound to our ears half as loud. For every 20 decibels, it's going to be a quarter as loud and so on. Okay. So when we use the term soundscape, what do we mean? Um, I mentioned in the beginning how the traditional approach to sound in the environment uh, in recent years has been a little more towards the idea of just the overall sound level at an area. But increasingly studies since the 1960s have shown that that's not really an effective way to treat sound in our, our environment because every sound source is unique and means different things to us. So important thing to note here, sound is not the same thing as noise. Noise is unwanted sound and know that what's defined as unwanted will vary from project to project. The context of the site you're working on, um, whether it's a, a commercial area, a park, um, an outdoor patio at a library, which sounds are wanted and unwanted are going to vary completely. And as I mentioned, overall loudness should not be the you know, focal point. The importance lies in the emotional and informational significance of each sound in the soundscape. 
So let's talk about how we categorize these and break these different sounds out. First, we've got our keynote sounds. These set the tone in their space. They're, they're in a sense, the background, the foundation that other sounds sit on top of. Um, if you're in a city, this could be the sound of traffic. It could be the electrical hum of HVAC units. Um, in this train station here, it might be um, the sound of people talking in this crowd all around you. If you're in a public park, maybe the sound of rushing water, the wind blowing in through the leaves. And on top of these keynote sounds are going to sit our sound signals. These are the foreground. These are the sounds that convey information that we want to hear. So this might be um, human speech. You know, you're talking to someone, you want to hear them over the traffic. You want to hear them over the, the crowd around you. And this also includes bells and whistles and things like a truck backing up or maybe uh, announcements coming over the intercom in this train station, foreground sounds. And lastly, we've got sound marks. These are audible landmarks. And good examples here are, you know, the Big Ben clock tower in London. Uh, maybe if you live on a coastal community, it's the sound of a foghorn. Uh, for me growing up, uh, my hometown was a big railroad switching yard. So the sound of train horns in the distance, um, I was hearing that all throughout my childhood. And, and even now, uh, it's a calming sound to me when I hear that. So these are the kind of sounds that are unique and important to the identity of people living in a certain area. And these need to be preserved or encouraged, if you can. Uh, do we have any questions up to this point, Jer? No, uh, we're good. And my idiot, my my audio is a little weird. My my internet's being a little uh, mean to me at times. So if I come in and out, sorry about that. But okay. uh, no questions so far. So let's keep going. All right. So we've got some of this background knowledge in our pockets now. Let's talk about when we want to apply this to an actual project, what is a good way to establish design objectives with sound in mind? So we've talked about the acoustic characteristics of the space, um, the size of the space, the surroundings, the material and shape of surfaces. We've talked about characterizing each sound present, the color or pitch or frequency, um, how long those sounds occur and when they occur, the relative loudness of those sounds to each other, and the emotional and informational significance of each sound. Put those in your back pocket for now. When we're establishing design objectives, let's pay attention especially to the intended use of the space. Um, this could refer to, you know, zoning, sound related laws in the area you're developing and the surrounding environment, whether that's, um, you know, different zones, different maybe residential or quiet areas or wilderness areas, and whether or not we need to prevent sound from our site from leaking out to those. Also, we want to pay attention to the intended users of the space because who is going to be using the space is also gonna have a massive effect on which sounds are going to be wanted and unwanted. So considering the space's intended use, some questions you might wanna ask are, is it a work area that requires quiet and speech privacy? In that case, maybe you wanna put dense hedges or sound barriers of some sort between seating areas. Maybe you want the space between seating areas to be greater. Is it a performance area that requires sound to go from the stage to the audience? Um, you probably want to design this area to, uh, you know, make that as effective as possible while not leaking out to nearby private residences, quiet areas, or wilderness areas where we, you know, the sound that might be intended 
in, uh, on our site could be considered noise in those areas. Similarly, if you've got a nearby highway or busy street, um, will the noise from that pervade the space if you don't account for it? And if your space is intended to be a quiet area or a, a public park or something that's surrounded by streets on both sides, if it's pervaded by that traffic noise, will people even use the space that much? So these are gonna be important things to consider uh, when you're deciding which sounds are wanted and unwanted on your site. Now, how about our spaces intended users? So these figures are from a study by Jan Kang and Wei Yang. They interviewed a large group of people in a couple different public squares in the UK and asked them to rate uh, how they felt about different sounds around them. So what we're looking at here is by age group, how many of the respondents rated these two sounds their favorite, uh, they were neutral about it, or they rated them annoying. So looking at music from stores, you can see in these younger age groups, uh, most of the respondents are indifferent or it's even their favorite sound. Not many said it was annoying, but when you get up to the older generation here, almost 80% are saying music from stores is annoying. Less than 10% are saying it's their favorite. And how about bird song? Well, everyone likes bird song, but you can see pretty clearly that the younger groups here, um, you know, more of them are saying it's annoying or they're indifferent to it. Whereas when you get up to 65 and up, almost 95% of the respondents are saying bird song is their favorite sound they hear. None of the respondents said it was annoying. So who is going to be using your space age-wise may very well have a big impact on which sounds are wanted and unwanted and whether you know encouraging or minimizing some of these sounds should be prioritized. And there have also been studies that show that across cultures, there are significant differences in sound preference. So when they asked respondents uh, how favorable they considered speech sounds in a public square, over 50% of Greeks rated speech sounds annoying, less than 1% of Germans rated them annoying, and almost half of Italian respondents said they were their favorite sound. So culture is gonna have a big, big impact on which of these sounds need to be prioritized and not um, definitely something you wanna consider. Maybe you wanna do a study ahead of time or do some research into these cultures and see you know, which sounds should be emphasized and which should be reduced. Now, when we're defining our objectives, we're gonna focus on site context, you know, the use of the site, the users. We want to focus on the information content of each sound present and the relative loudness of each sound compared to the others. And this is an important point here. Our objectives don't need to be really technical or be filled with numbers and decibels. It's really just about um, the relation of these sounds to each other. So these are a couple examples from the Zion National Park Soundscape Project. These are some of their objectives they established. Uh, natural sounds are audible and discernible with common noise intrusions by visitors and park operations concentrated near roads and heavily developed areas. This is a, a great objective here. It's, it's a uh, not too technical, it's specific, and it's referring to the relative loudness of these natural sounds compared to uh, the human generated sounds. Another one was noise levels that mask important auditory signals for wildlife should be uncommon and limited to roads and heavily developed areas. 
this term masking we're going to talk about a little later as well the idea is again relative loudness we want the noise levels in the park here from you know human generated sounds not to be so loud in relation to wildlife that they cover up wildlife communication and lastly moving water should be the dominant sound heard again relative loudness is the important thing to note here okay now shaping the soundscape we know uh, how sound works in space how we want to establish our design objectives now let's talk a little bit about how we might apply some of this to our designs. So this is gonna be our MO. If you take anything away from this presentation, take this away. It seems kind of obvious, but it's a good phrase just to keep in the back of your mind. We want to provide wanted sounds and reduce the level of unwanted sounds. Okay, providing wanted sounds, what does this mean? Well, a popular example is uh, utilizing water features. Uh, the studies have shown that pretty much across cultures, across age groups, everyone loves the sound of running water. So if you've got existing water features on your site, maybe uh, a creek or a natural waterfall or something, it's probably gonna be effective to focus some of your design around that. Or maybe you can add water features like fountains. And again, the site context is at play always. So if you've got a you know, tranquil park, maybe a quiet trickling fountain is more appropriate. But if you're in an urban square or a commercial center, a large, powerful, more showy fountain is probably more appropriate. We can also choose plants that attract birds and wanted insects. As we saw with that bird song graph, that's generally a pretty appreciated sound. So we, if we can attract some of those birds, um, it's going to increase the perceived pleasure uh, of the site. You can also include interactive features or passive features like sound sculptures. Uh, you know, this is a little extra, but I think these are cool examples. So let's, uh, let's listen to these real quick. This is an Aeolian harp, and it's played entirely by the wind. So this is the kind of installation that uh, you could install in your site, and it's going to generate some nice sounds just by itself. Okay, and this example is uh, called the C organ. It's a, an installation in Croatia. This one actually won the award in 2006 for best urban space in the EU. And what they've done here is uh, this space right along the seaside, they've put organ pipes down underneath the water level that reach up underneath the concrete here and generate some sound. Personally, I like this one better, but you know, awards are nice. Okay, how about reducing the level of our unwanted sounds? This is gonna be a little more involved than producing sound, but some of the things we can do are using appropriate forms, boundaries, using sound absorbent materials, things like green walls, green roofs, dense hedges. We can choose highly sound absorbent plants where possible. We can focus on the spacing on our site. This could be things like seating arrangements, you know, in a, in a public park, maybe you want your benches or seating a, a little further away from each other for speech privacy. Um, but 
a cafe on a busy street in comparison can afford to have closer seating arrangements because the ambient sound level, the keynote sounds of that traffic is gonna be louder and the leakage of sounds from one conversation to the next is not gonna be so bad. Also, just hearing more people talking around is gonna kind of increase the energy level, which is probably what you're looking for in this context. And again, masking. We can mask some of these unwanted sounds with our wanted sounds. A really uh, popular example is rushing water. So if we've got a fountain or a waterfall, the sound of the water here can help cover up some of the noise from our unwanted sounds like traffic. Okay, real quick about materials here. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into different materials, but this is a good example from a study by Greener Cities EU, they called Hosanna. Um, what they've done here is next to a roadway, they've put a stone gabion barrier, and then they put a porous clay barrier and compared the sound reduction. So with the stones, you get a 6 dB reduction. And if you remember the chart from the beginning, that's you know less than 10, that's a little bit of a reduction, noticeably a bit quieter. Whereas the porous clay, same shape of the barrier here, absorbed 10 decibels, which is half as loud. So maybe it doesn't seem like quite a big difference, but Again, when we're talking about the relative level of sounds to each other, you know, if we got a walkway here and people walking and talking, or there's birds in the trees, if this is enough compared to this to stop the traffic sounds from masking the birds or the speech, then we're going to get a much better perception of the space. It's going to be a lot more enjoyable for users. So how about plants? I mentioned highly sound absorbent plants. What does that mean? Well, what we're looking for are thick leaves, leaves that are densely packed together. We want leaves with high surface area and leaves that grow out from branches at larger angles. So here are a couple good examples. Western red cedar here, um, very thick hedge and also thinking about uh, you know, the, the color or pitch of these sounds. Think about what you're trying to reduce with this hedge. If it's something like a lower frequency rumbly sound, maybe you want it thicker so it's gonna absorb more of those long wavelength low frequencies. Also plantain lily, this is a great one. Thick leaves. Uh, it's really dense. They're at these various angles here. If you think about the um, rough textured surface diagram from the beginning, that's what this is going to do to sound coming in. Sound's going to get trapped in between these leaves, get absorbed by them, and you're really going to help reduce some noise. So here's a good example. This is from a land effects client, Coleman and Associates. This is at the uh, Austin, Texas Central Library. I like this example because um, we got a roadway here with traffic. You're gonna get uh, you know, the sounds of car engines and uh, you know, the tires on the pavement. And what they've done here is they put this big berm, this mound of earth that's also landscaped, so that's gonna block some of the sound that's coming low here along the ground. These plants are gonna block some of the higher frequencies. And these benches all along here, even though they're hard and flat, um, these irregular shapes are going to help disperse the reflections and not make you feel like you're in a big echoey cavern here. It's more of a, a nice quieter walkway as compared to here right along the street. So what might this sound like? 
This is another example from that Hosanna study. They measured the sound here in this pedestrian area alongside this roadway without any treatment and then after putting a low barrier and a line of trees there. So here's the actual measurement of the sound that they captured. And what I've done is I've kind of recreated this using this actual data. And we're going to listen to before and after this treatment, uh, how intelligible the speech is as you're lock, uh, walking along here. So first let's listen to without any treatment. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Put a little tap in the sand. One tap. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 really positive? Okay, so you can catch some of the conversation, but especially when cars drive by, they really mask that speech and you can't really discern what they're saying. Now let's listen to, and that was the, uh, the black curve here. So now let's listen to with the barrier and trees, this green curve, you can see uh, we've got quite a bit of noise reduction here. Let's see what that sounds like. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Put it up to 11. 11, exactly. One loud. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. So this one, you can clearly hear the speech is a lot more intelligible. And with this kind of a difference, even though you can still hear the traffic, you know, the goal is not to just completely eliminate the sound of traffic. If we can bring it low enough that the speech is the, you know, it's intelligible over the traffic, probably people are going to use this pedestrian path a lot more than without any treatment. And also thinking back to the frequencies, you know, the pitch, the color of sounds. If we look down here in the low range, not much is actually happening to the low frequencies, but that's okay because human speech lives up in this mid range around a thousand hertz. So if we're reducing the level of traffic sound in this frequency range, we're going to free up a lot more room to be able to hear the speech, even though these aren't affected. So here's a, a couple other examples here. Let's say you've got a roadway or a tramway that's raised up and underneath you've got a bike path or a pedestrian path. Even just adding a low hedge along the road or tramway here can have up to a 10 decibel decrease in this noise down to the pedestrians. So, you know, as we saw with this last graph, you know, up here we've got a little over 10 decibels, that can make a huge difference. Um, another strategy might be building parallel barriers here. What's going to happen here is the sound, uh, the noise coming off of the wheels on this track are going to get caught between these barriers rather than projecting along the ground out to here. It's going to bounce back and forth between these and a lot of the sound is going to be absorbed. Uh, another really effective strategy is building these big berms along roadways, um, especially if you landscape these or if you build them in this tiered structure rather than just rounded. That can have a huge, huge noise reducing effect. So in this example, it's going to be a quarter as loud to people on the other side of this. Okay, now as you take some of these techniques and apply them to some of your designs, you might come across the question, well, I've got a limited budget or I got this noise source and that noise source. Is it going to be more effective to use one highly efficient noise treatment on one noise source or many less effective treatments to cover all the bases?
So to answer this, let's think back to how decibels work. Again, we don't need to get too deep into the math here, but just remember that decibels don't add together linearly. So if we've got two different noise sources and each are producing 50 decibels, they do not add up to 100 decibels to a listener. The way this works is two noise sources, each producing 50 decibels, are going to sound to the listener like 53 decibels. Okay, so back to this question. Let's say this noise source of the two we completely eliminate. We spend millions of dollars and build this massive tunnel loaded with acoustic foam to block all of this traffic noise here, but we still got this 50 decibel noise source in addition. To the listener, it's going to sound like 50 decibels. So even if we do the world's best sound treatment to this noise source, at most we're taking three decibels off the total loudness here. And if you remember from the beginning, that's you know a little quieter, but it's just barely noticeable. However, if we can do some you know less expensive treatment to both of these sources, if we can take 10 decibels off both, then the loudness to the listener is going to be 40 decibels. So generally, it's going to be more cost effective to use cheaper strategies and cover all your bases than to focus on just one noise source. Okay. So let's look at a little example now that we've kind of covered most of the information here. This is at the Atlanta Botanical Garden. They've got an amphitheater performance area here. And they've also got the rest of the bot botanical garden here. And let's think about what our objectives might be. Um, in the amphitheater, we probably want to emphasize the source sound of the performance. You don't want to feel like you're listening to the echoes of the space as much as the performers. Yet back here, your objectives might be something like um, trickling water in this stream is the dominant sound heard, or bird sounds and the waterfall in the pond can be discernible over the performance. So I think they've done a really great job here. Let's kind of look at what they've done. In the amphitheater, we've got this tiered structure. So you're going to get wherever you're sitting, the sound of the performance. It's not going to be blocked by the people in front of you. We've got grass on these seating areas rather than, you know, cement benches that are going to reflect a lot of the sound. Um, back behind here, we've got wilderness areas and you can't see in the map but there's also private residences back here as well and this existing thick forest is really going to help block some of the sound from getting back too far now how about in these other areas of the garden well we want them quiet back here so what they've done is built this wall in the back of the amphitheater and that's going to block some of the sound that's going out here uh, it's only going to come out at a greater angle. We've also got all these trees to help block some of the sound coming up over the wall. So back here by the pond, back here by the stream garden, a lot of this sound from the amphitheater is going to be prevented from reaching here. And uh, again, the, the site context matters. So this event lawn, we don't have as many big uh, big trees here blocking sound. We don't have a big noise barrier because this is intended as a space that people can hear the performance, maybe a little quieter than in the amphitheater, but they can still hear it. And behind here is the parking lot. So if some of the noise from the performance leaks back here, it's not really that big of an issue. It's gonna be quieter than if you're in the amphitheater and it doesn't need to be completely eliminated. 
In fact, many of the people showing up to the botanical garden are probably coming for the event, so it may even add to the excitement and be beneficial. Okay. Lastly, let's do a little quick review and we'll be done. So, from the beginning, how sound and acoustics work, those concave and flat hard surfaces are going to reflect sound and enhance the sense of space if that's what you're after. Those convex and textured surfaces are going to disperse and absorb the sound and make it feel more personal. Low frequency sounds require thicker materials, denser materials to be absorbed. Not all sounds are created equal. Consider your keynote sounds, the background, your signal sounds, the foreground, informational, and your sound marks. Consider your site's intended use and intended user's preferences when you're establishing your design objectives. And then we want to determine which sounds in the space are wanted and which are noise, because now from that point we're prepared to actually make design choices to make that happen. I know this is a lot on one slide, but I just want to have it here so that if you come back to this later, you can just pop right here and you know get the quick overview. So when we're designing the space, we want to provide wanted sounds and reduce unwanted sounds. You can use appropriate forms and spacing to shape the space acoustically. Choose your plants and your planting areas wisely and don't put all your eggs into one basket. If you can use noise reduction techniques on as many noise sources as you can, you're gonna have a good uh, beneficial effect on the soundscape. So one closing point here before we end, um, many design choices can fulfill two needs with one deed. Meaning if you've got a limited budget, you can't afford to spend a ton of the time on this project focusing on just sound. Um, a lot of your design choices that you're already making can be tweaked just a little bit to benefit the soundscape at the same time. Or you can make design choices that both provide wanted sounds and get rid of your unwanted sounds. Uh, for example, some plant choices will absorb noise and they may also attract native birds to your area and improve visual aesthetics. So the more objectives we can accomplish with one design choice, the better. Um, we talked about those noise reducing berms along a roadway. That can be expensive, but maybe if you've got excess soil, stones, earth from construction work elsewhere on the site, you can reuse that to build a little berm and you know get some some added functionality out of that extra material all right that's all i have today um, i'm really excited to have shared this with you i hope you can take some of this knowledge and apply it to your own designs um, if you got any further questions after we answer these ones that have come in during the webinar you can reach me at my email here alex at landeffects.com or my personal website, alexonaudio.com. And here are some additional resources. If you wanna see more um, examples and case studies of how different sites have been improved with some of these techniques, I highly recommend the Hosanna Project Report and the Sonoris Report. Um, this research by Jan Kang and Wei Yang and Lex Brown is really good. And this book by R. Murray Schaefer, uh, The Tuning of the World, is widely considered kind of the birth of soundscape studies in landscape architecture. All right, so that's all I have. Um, Jer, shall we do the Q&A? Absolutely. Got some great questions here. Um, let's start with, uh, with one. Um, are there cultural considerations to sound design, kind of like there is for color? Ah, kind of like there is for color. So we, we did touch on that a bit here with, um, I didn't put too much of this research here, I just wanted to touch on it, but 
Uh, you can find some studies by Yang and Kang that really go into this more. Um, you know, the, it's really the preference of users by culture can vary. So it's not so much um, the frequency of the sound that changes, you know, the preference, um, but just culturally the emotional significance of those sounds that are going to vary between cultures. Very cool. Um, and this one might be a little more difficult to answer, but, um, but he um, asks is, you know, is sound basically just line of sight and, and, you know, continuing on that and, and considering barriers, um, is it better to layer multiple barriers or um, just focus on the material uh, of a single barrier? Um, and are you only kind of focused on that line of sight direction? Is, 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 is that enough to kind of give you something to kind of answer? Yeah, yeah. So um, that is a little more of a <laughs> complicated question. Um, but let's see. Uh, when we talked here about multiple noise sources and how it's better to use uh, a little more, uh, you know, less effective treatments to cover all your bases, when it comes to one noise source, um, generally it's going to be best to just do one treatment for that noise source and make that as effective as possible. So, you know, if, if you've got a a tramway, um, it's probably going to be more effective to just build one uh, berm out of earth or just put those parallel noise barriers in than it would be to do both of those and also add a line of trees or something. Because, um, let's go to, so you can see how some of these treatments affect the different frequencies or colors of sound differently. And in order to determine how these treatments are gonna affect the different frequencies, that's, that gets pretty mathematical involved. You'd probably wanna um, get an actual consultant out if you're getting that serious about it. But if you apply multiple techniques to one sound without really analyzing what they're doing, you may get even kind of a boost in one frequency or cancel out the effect if they're doing uh, you know, slightly different things to the different colors of sound. And uh, as far as line of sight, um, because we've got um, reflective surfaces all around, some of them, you know, we, we can't treat, uh, those sound reflections are gonna come off of those surfaces. And even if, you know, your noise source is uh, west of where you're standing on the site, but you've got a reflective surface on the east, if you've got a noise barrier on the west side that's blocking the source, but the source sound is getting over the barrier and reflecting off of the surface to the other side of you, you're still gonna hear it. So it, it's not just line of sight. You wanna pay attention to the surroundings, you know, all the space around you. Where could this source sound be reflecting off of, especially if you've got, you know, a, a big flat tall wall on the side of a building or something. Very cool. Um, how about one one last question? This also might be a little difficult to answer, um, but um, you know you, you showed the the preferences of of sound by age group. Um, but but Fred also mentions what about taking into account um, like hearing loss? Is that something to take into account that an aging population um, you know can not hear certain things and and of course has different preferences. Um, so so how, um, basically, would hearing loss come into play with kind of the, the thought of the sound design as well? Um, it, it could come into play. That's, it's kind of a hard thing to answer because, I mean, statistically, you know, the older generations are going to have more hearing loss than the younger generations, but it is going to be more on an individual personal basis. And 
it's it's also very hard to characterize hearing loss because we have um, you know these these different colors of sound across the spectrum and this is actually something I, I studied in college a bit, um, hearing loss compared to sight loss, for example. Um, it's, it's easier to say, uh, no, I can't see that, than to say, oh, the, the bass sounds are quiet compared to the high sounds. It's, it's a lot harder to characterize that since we we hear things all across the spectrum at different volumes and everyone's hearing loss has a different kind of color characteristic to it. So uh, it might be something working up or looking up, see if you can find papers about it, but it's not something that um, I've seen in my research uh, comes up a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I did, I did see an article in, uh, uh, landscape architecture magazine where, where they said in, in um, this one garden they focused on things like um, having things that can be touched um, for people who were you know completely deaf or or even blind you know um, and, and so just a, across all the senses to uh, yeah. g give them other things but um, well on that note um, this was fantastic we've already got um, some people saying to consider presenting this <laughs> at the ASLA <laughs> or something, which I would agree. This is really good. Um, it is. It was recorded. Everyone, it'll be on the website for you to watch again and reference. And otherwise, um, just have a good and safe weekend. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care.